So I'm going to put it way over here. Let me, let me pray for us. Father, what a joy and a privilege it is uh, to be with my sisters in Christ this morning. I thank you, Father, for the night that you gave them last night. What a blessing uh, to hear from my wife. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for Wanda and Jenny uh, for presenting last night. Thank you for the ladies that took the time out of their busy schedules uh, to be here. Lord, I pray that uh, what was taught last night um, and what was learned, Father, that would be put into application. And Father, as we gather as your people this morning, I pray, Father, for the time that we have together, Lord, as we concentrate on your word. Father, as we dive in uh, to the chapter that describes what Christian love is, may you use it to edify us, Father. Correct us where we fall short. Help us to see the error of our own lack of love. And may you be glorified through it all. In Jesus' name, amen. So, would anybody like to uh, give me the first three verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 13? Oh, okay. Wow. What did you feed them last night? Oh, anybody see the little meme of Winnie the Pooh standing in front of the mirror? He's looking at his belly and he says, I'm waiting for the salad I ate last week to do its magic. <laughs> All right, Ruth, you got it? No? Okay. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and I have not love, I'm a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and all faith, as so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I gave away all I have and I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. So ladies, let me ask you a question. When you hear the word love, what do you think of? Go ahead. Who? Jesus. Jesus. Okay, that's the, that's the great Christian answer. Hearts. What else? The notebook. The notebook. Oh. <laughs> you know, I've never seen that movie. Anyway, go ahead. Go ahead. Some other words. Your kids? Selfless? Sacrifice? Sacrifice. Heart. Heart. How come I haven't heard a husband in here yet? Can I get an amen? Thank you, baby. So, for Christians, and I love it, ladies, I'm just teasing with you. I love it that you said Christ first. Christ, when we think of love, we should think of Christ ultimately. So, tell me what the world thinks of when they think of love. Self-love, happiness, what, sexual love, yes, that's true, what else, self-care, self I couldn't hear you, peace, okay, when I, you know, uh, when a man thinks of love, sexual love is probably one of the first things he thinks of, he equates that, especially an ungodly man. Um, I used to tell my daughter when she would start a date and she was about 16 years old and um, I was sitting there talking to her about it and all this kind of stuff having the dad talk and she goes dad why are you telling me all this she goes that's the way you might have acted when you were a kid but boys don't act like that now <laughs> and I proceeded to tell her I gave her this little speech I said you know that 16 year old is gonna pick you up he's thinking of one thing girl and one thing only and he ain't getting it from you. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> and that's the way you got to understand. Men, boys, were wired differently. And so when you think of couples coming together to love, we think of, you know, following in love. How many of you uh, married your high school sweetheart in here? Look at that. Look at the hands going up. Pretty amazing, right? So when Kathy and I met, I was 15 years old, uh, fell in love with this little brown-haired Southern Belle. I mean, I, I, I had grown up all over the world. I wind up in Chester, 
living in Hidden Valley, I, I see Kathy in there, and I, I really was self-conscious about myself. I thought I, I was a very unattractive uh, young boy, and I would never talk to a girl, never talk to, I just wouldn't do it. I was too shy and everything else. And Kathy walks up to me on a, in a break. Uh, I, I had flunked algebra, and she was trying to graduate early, and so I, I'm, we're walking out of class, going to the break room. I don't know anybody. I mean, as I, I went to a small Catholic school in Petersburg called Gibbons. It was 20 people in my class. I'm going to summer school. There's a thousand kids running around Salem Middle School. I'm just a fish out of water. And the only thing that saved me is I'd been all over the world, lived in Germany for five years. And so I, I knew how to act in a strange crowd and just melt away. And Kathy walks up to me and she goes, your name's Wells, isn't it? And I said, why is she talking to me? <laughs> is there something wrong with me? Is she going to make fun of me? That's the way I felt. And she said, uh, my last name's Wells, too. I said, oh, that's real nice, and walked away from her, just scared to death. Over the next couple of months, I got the courage to, she, she became my study partner, and I, and I reached under the table, my first overt act to let her know I cared about her, first overt act. Shaking like a leaf, put my hand under the table, and I reach over and I grab her hand. So I'm grabbing her right hand. I want you to picture this. She's sitting, to me. I grab her right hand, and the teacher's in front of us, and I'm like shaking like a leaf, and she pulls it away. I was devastated. <laughs> my heart was crushed. <laughs> well, before y'all jump on Kathy too hard, she said, I was trying to write, and you took my right hand. <laughs> Fast forward a couple of weeks. I kissed her for the very first time. We were out of the bus loop, and we went to kiss, and we it, butted heads. Boom. We... <laughs> so you, so as, as this develops, I asked her for a telephone. I said, can I call you? And she said, sure. And I got on the bus. They didn't get the phone number. <laughs> so you know what a love, strict, uh, love struck 15 year old does? He goes through the whole phone book in Chester phone book and went down and found every Wells and I called every Wells in the phone book. <laughs> what I didn't know, there were two Kathy Wells that went to Thomas Dale. So I'm calling and calling. Thank goodness I didn't get that one. But anyways, I kindly called and her dad answers the phone. I went through all these things, no, Kathy lives here, got the wrong number, blah, blah, blah. You don't know how much that took me to do that. So I, I pick it up, get her dad. Hello. I said, uh, excuse me, sir. Is Kathy Wells here? Uh, there? And she, he said, nope. Oh. Okay. Bye. And hung up. She comes home. Her dad says, some boy called you. <laughs> Didn't leave a message or anything. So. What I'm trying to show you is the progression that of, of, of a immature love that I had for my girlfriend grew into a love to make her my wife, which still wasn't the love that God called me to love my wife with. And so as it grew, I wasn't a Christian. And uh, as I came to know Christ and started understanding what Christian love was, I wish I, ladies, I could tell you that I love my wife the way she deserved to be loved her whole life. And that's not true. I can't say that to you. I've made many mistakes in my life, sinful mistakes in my life. And yet God in his mercy and grace has given me a love for Kathy that is not based on my emotions it's not based on how I feel that day. It's not based on whether uh, Kathy uh, wakes up and smiles at me in the morning, although she does every morning. It doesn't depend on that. It, my love for her depends on God's love for me and the passage in 1 Corinthians 13. You see, if we can fully grasp this concept of love and how we're to love not only our spouses, again, I said this is, this is written for believers for believers. And, it, and we're blessed if we have a husband, if you have a husband, if I have a wife that, that uh, loves the Lord, because it makes it much easier to love. Now, 
women, and there's some in, the, in our church have been very faithful, um, are married to unbelievers. They still love their husbands. It doesn't mean they don't love them because they're an unbeliever. They still love them, but their, their relationship is different because their husband's first love is not their first love. And it always puts a strain in those relationships. So um, I always pray for our sisters in Christ, your sisters in Christ here at the church. I pray for them weekly, uh, for the ones that I know of that have husbands that do not know the Lord. Because it is, it is difficult. Could you imagine, ladies, that you all, who are Christian women, if you didn't have a husband who loved the Lord, how your life would be? Uh, some may not even be here today because their husbands won't let them leave and come. Francis Shaver was one of the greatest Christian apologists of the previous century. And in his work, The Mark of a Christian, he asserts there is a distinctive mark that if, you, that if we do not display, the world has a right to say we are not Christians. Jesus said it this way in John 13, 34, 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know you are my disciples if you love one for another. So just as Francis Schaeffer said that the world has a right to say you're not a Christian if you don't love, you've got to get this principle down, ladies, love. Um, and it can be difficult. Tell me some things that can be, cause you to have difficulty loving your brothers and sisters in Christ. Pride? No, I'm, I'm not going to let you get away with one word answers on this one. So how does pride affect our relationship with your brothers and sisters in Christ? Okay, so we think we're better than them. So if we get into a discussion with somebody else and then it starts to get a little bit heated and a, and a little bit ugly and then feelings are hurt, we walk away and next thing you know, you're not talking to that sister in Christ when you walk into church. So, is that love? No. So when you so let's start and think about that pride for a moment. You know, pride, God, pride comes before a fall, right? I mean, that's for all of us. I think of every time I ever got in a fight with Kathy, it was always over my pride. Always, it, it was never over anything else. It was always pride. And uh, so once we get that pride in check, it's a whole lot easier to let that love flow. The pride is almost like a valve, if you will, that suppresses the love of the heart. And think about that. So you got, you got, you got this really tight wheel and it's stuck because it's your pride and it won't let you love others. And what you have to do is loosen that wheel of pride, get rid of it altogether, remove it so that the love flows freely. An example of that is, how do you respond when somebody sends you a text or an email that does not please you? <laughs> so that's why you're not responding to my text? You get angry. How many of you have misread a text or an email? Whoa! Hands up, right? You, you read it, and you're looking at it, and you're going, holy smoke, where'd this come from? And then, and then before too long, that little voice inside your head goes, well, I'll show them. I'll let them know what I think of them. I'm not going to talk to them anymore. I'm not going to invite them over. And then the next thing, it's a whole misunderstanding. I, I'll tell this story because Charles has given me permission to tell this story. Uh, when Charles first visited our church, it was just... Uh, well, the first time I really met him, Penny, was uh, that night we were over at uh, uh, one of the first charter members of the church. He was an elder that wound up leaving very soon because he was different in theology and doctrine with us. And I was unaware of. And um, so we're over at his house for dinner. And it's Tom and Penny, your pastor and Kathy and Dave and Linda Listrom. And then this other couple from the church. And then Charles was there with his wife at the time. And they come in and they sit down and we're talking with them and inter I get introduced to them and that's it. That's the only conversation I have with him. That's it. Well, he comes, we, this is about 2000 and church was built in 2009. So I'm guessing 2010, 
Charles, uh, my office was downstairs, and he walks in. He says, do you have a minute? Can I can speak to you, Pastor? And I said, sure. He said, I need to get this off my chest. I'll go, okay. He goes, I just want to tell you basically what a jerk you were. I reached out to you when my marriage was in trouble, and you just, you never responded. And my heart was broken. My heart was broken. And I said, Charles, I said, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, I, I talked to so-and-so, and he told me to call you, and I called you and left you a message, and you never called me back. I said, Charles, I never got that message. And you could have seen the look on his face. He said, what? I said, I never got your message. He said, you mean I've been mad at you for five years? I mean, three years for nothing? I, and this, we can laugh about it now. I, I was almost in tears because this, because, you know, he reached out to me and I wasn't there. And as a shepherd, what, what's my desire is to shepherd God's people. And next Sunday he was at church and he's a faithful member here now. But look what happened that he let one situation that he did not go back and address allow him to have bitterness in his life for three years. Now, I want you to think a minute, ladies. Think in your own lives right now. Is there anybody in your life that you have chosen to be angry at? Because that's what you're doing. Have you, been, are you, have you chosen to be angry and upset with them because something perceived or actual that they did to you? I would encourage you to pray about it. Go to the Lord with it. Call, write, meet that person. It, it does you no good to keep bitterness in you. We've all heard it before. When I'm angry and upset with somebody, it's like drinking poison, hoping the other person dies. Charles didn't even know. He was mad at me and I didn't even know it. So who was upset for the three years? Every time he thought about me. He was and that's what happens in our life so so christian there is no place in a christian's life for the pride to come in and affect our love for our brothers and sisters it's just there's no place for it it's sin blatantly sin tell me something else that hinders our loving our brothers and sisters in christ besides pride Okay, well said. So, some pe you know, I've had people tell me, that I don't like you, I didn't like you before you were a pre preacher, Mark. <laughs> some of you knew me back then. Um, because you were, when you put that uniform on, you were so cocky. And, you know, you, you just thought you knew everything. And, and when people tell you that, you're like, oh, I didn't know I came across like that. But sometimes... Our personalities will not jive with other people. Does that mean we can't love them? Does it mean we try to make an effort to love them? And, so, you know, I, I, I've seen this before. Well, husbands and wives, we do this all the time. You see the husband and you're going, man, I really like the wife, but the husband is a jerk. Do we really have to go over to their house? That's why everybody checks with their spouses before they come see me. So anyway, so... Uh, Sometimes that happens. And, and, and even with husbands and wives, how many of you in here, you don't have to raise your hands because this is a rhetorical question, married somebody that's opposite of you? You know, Kathy and I are opposite. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? You're raising your hands anyway. We all, we're just different people. You know, Cal, Pastor Cal and Gina, they're reverse of Kathy and I. Gina and I are a lot alike, and Kathy and Pastor Cal are a lot alike. If there were two of me in the house, it wouldn't work very well. But the, we always need that person that, that helps us out. And the same thing with relationships when you're loving a brother and sister in Christ. You know, love was lacking in the city of Corinth. We, we went over that two weeks ago. In 1 Corinthians 1, uh, chapter 4, Paul addressed the divisions in the church. And I hope you, you remember this as I, as I refresh your memory from your reading uh, 1 Corinthians for that month. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it was sexual perversion that was tolerated. And in uh, Corinthians 6, the Corinthians were going to court against one another. In chapters 8, 
In chapters 10, there were disagreements about personal freedom. And in chapter 11, Paul was confronted selfishness at the Lord's Supper. And then in chapter 12 through 14, there was pride regarding spiritual gifts. And so the mark of a Christian was lacking in the city of Corinth. And you could pick any church you want to in, in, in the world today. And there are some of these issues in all churches. Um, the overall context of 1 Corinthians makes Paul's discussion about love all the more important. You want to know why God put it, this in here for the church at Corinth and every other church in the first century and every other Christian ever since then was because the same thing that the Corinthians struggled with, you and I struggle with. And so he's given you the formula to deal with all of the issues in your life. So again, why does Pastor Mark, why do the elders of Grace Harvest, why do the Sunday school teachers here, why does every believer in this church emphasize Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 13? Because those are the tools that God has given us in our toolbox, in our spiritual toolbox, to live our daily lives that are holy and pleasing to God. So let's look at the importance of love as we get into verses 1 through 3 in relation to spiritual gifts. And before looking at each verse separately, several observations we need to make concerning verses 1 through 3. In the spirit of love about which he is talking, Paul changes this to the first person. Okay? So now he's talking in the first person. He wanted to make it clear that what he said applied to himself, just everyone in the church at Corinth. I've said this before. Um, you know that when Pastor Mark gets behind that pulpit, he's preached. I have preached to myself first. God has prepared the message for you. He preached it to me. I repent where the, where the word has pierced me. And I realize that I am in sin or disobedience to God. And I am not afraid to be in the pulpit and use myself as an example with the understanding that correction has been made. Uh, you will never sit me stand in that pulpit and, and say that sin is okay. And, but there are, and this is what Paul did. So I'm not doing anything. I mean, I look at scripture. I see how Paul preached. I see how uh, other people preached in scripture. And you ever, if you ever notice, the truly uh, faithful men of God will always proclaim the word of God. And they will say it, it applies to them, just not to you. And some pastors make the mistake of thinking that they should not show their faults to their congregation. Uh, matter of fact, I had somebody in the church tell me they, they are not here. They were visiting us for a while and they told me, uh, we, he, he came to my office and said, I, I, cannot, I cannot be a member of your church because I, I don't want my pastor to reveal his faults. I, he says, I have enough faults of my own. I don't need to hear yours. And I said, well, I'm, I'm sorry, but you don't see that in scripture. You don't, you don't see that in scripture. Um, so here, Paul wants to make sure you understand and that I understand that he's referring to himself as well. And so the structure of verses one through three is very clear, setting these three verses apart from the rest of the chapter. Okay. The first three verses, you can kind of take them and put them over on their own. Each verse begins with an if indicating Paul is speaking here hypothetically. He's thinking of the hypothetical possibilities. If. And this is very, very important to understand this passage. And to press the hypothetical dimensions even further, it seems clear that Paul is using hyperbole here. And we'll see that in just a second. The statements Paul makes in all three verses hypothetically take a particular gift to its ultimate expression. In verses 1 through 3, Paul seeks to demonstrate that any gift, any gift exercised to its high level performance is of greater diminished value if the gift is exercised without love. Let me say that again. He demonstrates to us through this passage that any gift exercised to its highest level of performance, if you do it perfectly, is of greatly diminished value if that gift is exercised without love. Love is the driving force or should be the driving force in everything you do, especially your spiritual gift. 
No. Application. If I have the spiritual gift of preaching and teaching and, and prophesizing, meaning speaking God's word, I don't take that gift and go into my house, look myself in the mirror and preach to myself. I don't do that because I love you and God has called me to. So the ultimate expression of my preaching is my love for you. So the ultimate expression of your gift should be the love that you have for your brothers and sisters in Christ. So if God has given you the gift of teaching, then you teach because you love God and you love your brothers and sisters. If you have the gift of mercy, you show mercy, not because you just feel sorry for little, little furry animals outside to get eaten by cats and little birds. That can, anyway, if you have the gift of mercy, you do that gift of mercy because of your love. Service. Everything, any gift that God's given you. If you find yourself and you have spiritual gifts, and you're resentful of them, you, you need to stop, pet, pray, and repent if you are getting annoyed using your spiritual gift. If you have the gift of service and all of a sudden you start, like, nobody's patting me on the back. Nobody's acknowledging what I'm doing. Nobody cares about me. Why should I continue to serve? What's taking place? Pride's coming in. You're turning that valve on and, and you're shutting it off rather excuse me you're shutting off the love because the pride's taking place now remember you're always going to fight with that ladies always constantly you're going to be fighting with the valve that god, that the enemy wants you to turn off love and god trying to keep the valve open and and remember you will never regret obedience to the lord i i'll promise you that even if it leads unto death, you will never, ever regret doing anything for the Lord. And especially loving and what you may think is the unlovable, you still need to love them. You know, ladies, we're living in perilous times. This morning, uh, uh, one of our brothers in Christ sent me a text message. And I've I, I basically been on a news blackout since November. And, and uh, I see the highlights of it, but I'm not, I'm not going into commentary. I'm not looking at comments. I'm just looking at that bold headlines for the most part. But someone sent me something this morning about Bill Mayer and his uh, show last night. And I think it was last night. And um, basically what he said was he talked about Christianity, and he's an atheist. And he's talking about all the conspiracy theories that happen, and we make fun of those people that believe in all these conspiracy theories. He said, but there's, have you ever read the book of Revelation? This is what he says. He said, you talk about a bunch of wacky people. They believe in dragons and locusts and all this world stuff coming in. He, basically, he's saying, because of what we believe, we're a danger to this country. Folks, that's, I want you to think about that just for a moment. Your pastor has been warning you for months now that the persecution is coming. When the mainstream person can get on TV and say that and nobody screamed hate speech. How come nobody screamed hate speech last night? How come nobody said, wait a minute, you just, you just said this about Christians that they're a bunch of wacko idiots and they're, in, they're, they're dangerous? Folks, that's the same thing that Hitler did in Nazi Germany to the Jews. It starts off real simple as, you know, uh, they look different than we do. They act different. They believe different than we do. Look, you know, they crucified Christ. Uh, there was all kinds of justifications. So folks, if there has ever been a time and place, whether you're an older mature woman in here, or you're a younger woman just married and, and, and a mother, it is so important that you understand the concept of Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 13. Because you are, we are living in perilous times, and no matter what happens, we still respond in love. Romans 12 tells us to do what to our enemies? Love, right? Do not repay evil with evil. Folks, you need to be ready to understand so when the, the comes, you don't, you, don't get, you, don't, you don't want to pick up your gun and go shoot them. You want to love them and pray for them. And so we get back here to Paul, and he's talking in the first person. In verse 1, Paul seems to suggest that living a, a loveless life 
I can become less than I was. If I live a loveless life, I will not be what God intends me to be. Worse yet, these people that live this loveless life are becoming something vastly inferior to once they once were. In verse 2, Paul speaks of a loveless saint in terms of a, the, his present state. He says, I am nothing. In verse 3, Paul looks to future rewards for one's sacrificial service. Seemingly great acts of sacrifice, sacrifice may win man's approval, but they will not win God's approval. Think about that. What, the, what, what, what we do on the outside looks like it's very sacrificial. But what is it done with? Is it done with a heart of love? Because that's what God sees. Paul takes what are considered to be the greatest gifts anyone could possess, starting with tongues, the ultimate gift for the Corinthians, and grants that each should, could be exercised to the fullest possible extent. Even then, these spiritual gifts would be of limited value unless exercised out of a heart of love. Again, gift has to be used with love of a believer. And love. Yes. Would you say, based on what you just said, that if we are exercising our gifts without love, then that would be the wood, hay, and stubble that would be burned up at the judgment seat? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and for the audio purposes, in case, in case Gina's question uh, wasn't picked up, would these works that we do without love, would they be burned up at the judgment seat of Christ. Absolutely. If you're not doing it with the right intent, you're not doing it for God. You're doing it for you. And, and evaluate, you know, do you evaluate your, how do you evaluate your life, ladies? At the, at the beginning of a day, as you get up and you have your prayer time, your quiet time with the Lord, you're on your way to work, you're home getting ready before the kids have to go to homeschool. And you're getting ready. Are you asking God that day, Lord, for example, this week, the pastor's come. He shared with me. I've read 1 Corinthians 13. Your wor word is so important to me, Lord. Would you reveal to me where I fall short in these areas? And when you ask that, be ready. Because God's going to open up that chest that you've got hidden. You know, the one with all the little secret compartments that you store all your stuff in that you don't want anybody to see. When you ask, when you, when you say to God, hey, God, open that up, and he will. He'll reveal to you uh, areas in your life that, that uh, need to be changed. And, and the important thing is if we don't get this love straight, it's like the building block of our relationship uh, with every other believer and our, and, and our Lord. We're commanded to do what? Love the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul. Now, we know that's humanly impossible to do, right? We cannot do that uh, without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that allows us to love Him. Because if we, what would happen if we love the Lord with our, our, all our heart, mind, and soul? What would happen? You wouldn't sin, right? If, I mean, you think about that. If I love the Lord with all my heart and all my mind and all my soul, we wouldn't sin. That won't be possible, ladies, until we get to heaven. That's our glorification. And you know what the great thing about heaven is for me? Is I won't sin. Not only will I be in the presence of the Lord and presence of all the other saints, you, my sisters in Christ, every sister that's ever been a Christian, every man is my brother in Christ. We are the family of God and we will be there. And for the first time ever, when you wake up in heaven and you have the presence of the Lord from your death, uh, you will not sin. There'll be no gossip that comes off your uh, mouth. There'll be no lust in your heart. No deceit upon your lips. No envy, no pride, no jealousy, nothing. You know, that's, that's why, have you ever thought about the judgment seat of Christ? And, and, and uh, Gina just brought that up. You know, there was a time when, <laughs> when I was a young, immature Christian. And I used to think, man. I, I see all these people in Christians for a long time and they're going to have all these crowns and I ain't going to have anything. I'm just going to be sitting back there and <laughs> woe is me. <laughs> there won't be any jealousy in heaven. There won't be anything at all. You know when the 12, you know, remember, remember when the apostles, they didn't grasp it either because what they want. Hey Jesus, don't worry about the other 10. 
can we sit at your left and right hand? As a matter of fact, they were so scared to ask Jesus, they got their mama to do it for them. <laughs> the original helicopter mom. <laughs> hey, Jesus, would you take care of my boys for me, please? See, they, they, they were even bucking for a place in heaven. Uh, we, won't, we won't worry about that. Um, so in verse 1, the gift of tongues, Paul first turns to the gift of tongues. Here is the gift at least some of the Corinthians prize the most. Tongues are the ability. Please, ladies, grasp this concept. Hold on to this concept. Tongues is the ability to speak an unlearned earthly language as seen in Acts 2. In the Corinthians, to the Corinthians, the ultimate in tongues was to be able to speak in a language which is not uh, was not earthly to the Corinthians the ultimate in tongues was to be able to speak a language which was not earthly they were doing the same thing that people do today they're trying to get some mystical knowledge that nobody else has so that they can speak in a different form folks there is I, I just I just cringe when I hear people say well you know pastor that's just your interpretation of scripture and and if you're a believer in Christ, you will speak in tongues. There are denominations that as part of their doctrine, they will say, and Assemblies of God is one of those, is that you will speak in tongues as a sign of your salvation. It's in their doctrinal statement. Well, what's wrong with that doctrinal statement? That would be like me saying, in order to be saved, you will be able to teach. Before you die. Is everybody given the ability to teach? Is everybody given the ability to. Every one of the gifts. No. There are different gifts to serve the body. And so. And then when, when you're striving for that one gift in particular. Why, why are you striving for that gift? What's the purpose of, of wanting this one gift all over all the others? And so. Here they were, and all we have to do is just go through Scripture, and you see when we talk about, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the hyperbole here with angels. I mean, Paul is just expressing the fact that if I spoke with the tongue, gift of tongues of angels, spoke with angels, that, what he's saying here, it doesn't happen. Just the same thing as nobody could have all knowledge and all wisdom. It, it, can't, it can't happen. Every time we see in Scripture, we don't see... The, the Bible doesn't say that when the, when the angels appeared to people, they spoke in the language of angels, and then it was interpreted this. We never see that, do we? So if the angels spoke in an unknown language, and they came and babbling, and they're babbling to you, and you have no idea what they're saying... It, then somebody has to interpret that or they give you the gift of interpretation. But we don't ever see that in Scripture. They speak in the language of the people. Whatever, whoever they're visiting, they speak to them in that language. Uh, this has sidetracked the church so much because people have put such an emphasis in it that what does it do? It's a distraction. Did God really say? You know, you listen to your pastor and he's reading this. But, you know, that he's, he's interpreting it wrong. You know, when I look at this passage and when I look at people that, that are well-intended, and they are my brothers and sisters in Christ, I don't, don't get me wrong, because they, they believe, they're just confused about this specific issue. And I'm not vain enough and not prideful enough to know that when I get to heaven, Christ may look at me and say, well, you really missed that one on, on a particular theological statement that you used to stand on. I'm not saying I'm not so prideful, but when you see something like this and it has caused so much division within the church and they make statements that you aren't saved, well, your pastor is going to hell then. The man who stands here week after week professes Christ as Savior, preaches the gospel, loves God's word, I'm going to hell because I don't speak in tongues. John MacArthur, R.C. Sproul, Charles Spurgeon, Martin Luther. John Calvin, all these people are in hell, according to some theological statements. See, you get away from, you get away from what, what the Bible says a saved person is. The thief on the cross, you all know me well enough to know, favorite, 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 favorite line in scripture. Today you will be with me in paradise, but after you speak in tongues. 
No, no, it doesn't say that. Because what gets us into heaven is we believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That He was perfect man and perfect God. He was 100% God, 100% man, and He died for my sins on the cross. And when He rose from the dead, He defeated death. He sits at the right hand of the Father. And I have confessed that with my mouth, and I believe it in my heart, and I am His child. Anything else I do or don't do doesn't take away my salvation. But because we love him, we want to study his word. We want to know what it means to love as Christ would have us to love. And so, again, back to this verse, Paul grants this hypothetically through unreal possibilities that one could speak even every human language and even the tongues of angels. But Paul declares, if this were done apart from love, it would not profit a man. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but not have love, I am a be, um, have become a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. All of us have seen those cartoons, uh, Charlie Brown cartoons. No? Okay. So, oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's as bad as one day I was talking to a bunch of people and I said, you know, the Duke. And they went, who? <laughs> I said, oh, I am officially old. I said, but you've seen the greatest Western ever, right? Josie Wells, the outlaw Josie Wells. No. Oh, it's the greatest Western. Come on. No? Okay. We can agree to disagree on that one. So, but but when, you, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you get into here and you, and you think of um, what, is, what is it profitable to a man uh, to speak in every human language, in every tongue, and the, Paul declares that apart from love, it would not profit me if I did that. And, and you're thinking of that clanging sound with, with, uh, with Charlie Brown. And... What does his teachers always sound like? Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> so there, you'll have to watch it now. <laughs> but anytime an adult talks, it's wah, 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 wah. That's what kids listen to, right? That's what, so moms, you ever want to know what your kid's thinking when you're talking to them? That's what they hear. Wah, 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 wah. Um, but that's, that's what you're getting the image here. When you try to share the gospel with somebody you don't love, listen to what I'm saying. When you try to share the gospel with somebody you don't love, all they hear is noise. People know when you care about them. People know when you love them. You knew when you were loved. Teenagers, the, the, I hated them. But I was so thankful God put me at Manchester High School because I, I fell in love with them. I fell in love with these young people who, who some of them, you know, didn't come from Christian homes. Some of them didn't know who their dad was. Some of them, their mom were crack addicts. And, the only, and, and I got a chance to love these young men on a football field that would, would have, and they knew I loved them. And they knew I cared about them. And they always gave me the opportunity to share God's love with them. Because when you love somebody and they know you love them, then you're telling them something because you love them and it means something to them. So pray for those that God has put in your path. Now, guys i'm realistic you're not gonna love a complete stranger but you should have that love for the lost you should have that love for the lost to to share god's word and i i couldn't help but think but could you imagine listening to a, a gong boom 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 for an hour some instruments are sound beautiful when they're played played alone you know, we could listen to gina play the piano all day long or somebody play the guitar and and and, and just sit and I, matter of fact a lot of times i just put that on when i'm doing sermons i'll just play instrumental music uh as i'm as i'm preparing my sermons um the violin is another sweet instrument and again i'm putting my plug out there anybody knows how to play the violin <laughs> i'd love uh but um but the cymbal and gongs really they're not in that group right we, we, they're, they're in an orchestra for emphasis, and that's as far as I'll go with that statement because I don't know anything else what they're there for. Um, but rather than being enjoyable, they can be very irritating if they're continually played. A tongue speaker w without love could speak loud and long. They can enrapture the crowd with their uh, eloquent speech, but apart from loving them, they don't hear the speaker. Exercise in love in accordance with the instructions set down by Paul. 
tongues could be edifying. So the people who were given the gift of tongues in Acts to speak in another language. And all we have to do is go to Acts and you see what happened. Uh, at the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon uh, the apostles and they preached God's word in love in the languages of the people that were gathered there. Remember, they had come all over. It was, it, they had come all over Jerusalem to be there. Oh, excuse me, all over the known world to go be in Jerusalem. And 3,000 were saved that day because the gift of tongues was exercised in love. What has been said in verse 1 in terms of the gift of tongues can be said for any gift as well. Any gift exercised primarily for the benefit of you, the one who is uh, exercising your gift. I'll put it this strongly. It's a prostitution of the gift. You're not using it for its design purpose. Love seeks to serve others to their benefit and at the sacrifice of the one who serves in love. Let me say that again. Love seeks to serve. Your love should seek to serve others to their benefit, not yours. See, sacrificial love is one who serves in love. And if you ever wonder why that you're... Um, you're not satisfied in your service to the Lord? Check your heart. See why you're doing what you're doing. And if, if you're not serving at all, if you're not serving at all, look inside yourself and say, why aren't I serving? So that moves us to verse 2, prophecy and faith. In verse 2, Paul turns to the two vitally important gifts of prophecy and faith. In the first, in, in the first verse, the gift of tongues is selected by the Apostle Paul. There he focuses on the benefit of the ultimate gift of tongues for others when exercised without love. Now Paul turns to the gift of prophecy. And what is the result if exercised apart from love? So the gift of prophecy described here is the ability to know mysteries and to gain knowledge. To know mysteries and to gain knowledge. Prophecy is the divine ability to know what we would not be able to know apart from divine revelation. So if you want a good definition of what prophecy is in the New Testament, prophecy is the divine ability to know what we would not be able to know apart from divine revelation. Prophecy is the divine ability to know what we would not be able to know apart from divine revelation. So when we study God's word and we look at God's word, you as a believer, God gives you the ability through the Holy Spirit to understand what he has to say here. He's not interested in what you think it says. He wants you to understand what it says. And if you've been at Grace Harvest longer than a minute, you know that we never take one verse out of context in this church. No believer ever should. We don't take a verse that says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me tattoo it across my side of my chest like a friend of my son's did and say look look coach look what i did i'm going oh yeah i hope you know what that means <laughs> when the persecution comes you're ready because you can do you can handle the persecution but so many people take that verse and say i can do anything anything i want to do god will give me the strength to do it no Always in context. So when we take a, we, we take a, a verse, we would never, I would never open up Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13 to, and open it up to you and not tell you what 1 Corinthians was about, right? Because that wouldn't do you any good. You had, you, that's why I spent a week, two weeks ago, that's why I spent that, for, that first hour with the introduction of, for, to Corinthians so that you understood what was going on in the city of Corinth and what, what, they, what they were dealing with. And uh, the, the Jeremiah passage, well, we love this one. Yes, Jenny. Yes, prophecy is the divine ability to know what we would not be able to know apart from divine revelation. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So, the, the passage, hey, the Lord, he knows me. He loves me. He's got all these plans for me. So I don't have anything to worry about. Now, the principle behind that is true because God is sovereign. But he was talking to a specific people, a specific time, and he wasn't talking to you and I today. So it's very important 
that we understand that Scripture, you as a Christian have been given that ability to look at a passage, take it into its context, understand the historical uh, place that it's in. See, Christians, Christianity is not for dummies. Okay? You don't have to be brilliant, but you do have to be a student. You do have to be a student. Why do you think we encourage so much the ladies' discipleship, the men's discipleship, the family groups, the Sunday schools, the reading of Scripture, the listening to other sermons besides your pastor? Why do we encourage all that? So that you will grow in your knowledge. I would dare say, I would put the knowledge of our men and women here at Grace Harvest against any church, any church, anywhere. I think that you ladies have a hunger and desire for to know God's truth. I am so thankful. When Gina came to me years ago, and, you know, uh, this was something new for us. Because we, you know, I, I, believe it or not, when we first started Grace Harvest, there was never going to be a Sunday school. I started to buy into this nonsense that they were, that, that the skinny jean people were telling us, right? <laughs> that, 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 no, that's the thing of the past. You just, you just need to have community groups. Don't worry about Sunday school. Well, then we built the building and we thought, well, we got space. So let's do a Sunday school. So we did a Sunday school. And then Gina came to me years later and said, Pastor, uh, would you consider, he said, you know, we have some women in the church that have, have husbands that don't come or they're not married. Would you consider doing a ladies Bible study? And, and, and we prayed about it. Let's go for it. Gina and Kathy started that group. Um, how many years ago was that, Gina? You remember? Seven years, six, seven years. A long time ago they started doing it. And Gina and Kathy would rotate and then they... Uh, Deborah Hansen came into the mix, right? And um, so we're, I'm excited for when it comes back starting up again. But there was a hunger and a desire for the, on Gina's part and the Kathy's part to teach the ladies of our church what it means to be a woman in the faith whose husband is not a believer, who's maybe widowed, divorced, or never married. And we want to make sure that there's always a place to learn here at Grace Harvest. That building is built over there. I mean, I'm, I'm so excited um, when we think about what God has done here at Grace Harvest. And we have an education building over there now for our children. I mean, it's absolutely beautiful. Uh, rooms downstairs for the little ones. You ladies are going to get one of the new classrooms. Yeah. Okay, you can thank me now. There you go. <laughs> yeah, we're moving you over there. No. Oh, I thought we, we decided we were going to give them that one room over to the right. Well, we will talk about this, ladies. We will talk about this, ladies. I know that, ladies. I know that, ladies. But I thought that you're, you know what, Pascal, he's right. I apologize, ladies. Uh, he is exactly right. Um, but if there's room over there for you, we're not using it. We'll stick you over there. Because <laughs> I don't want to see one of the rooms upstairs not being used, but... Um, and anyways, so that building is, is designed to educate our children and our young people and our men and women in being godly, to be able to stand when the persecution comes our way. And, and ladies, you know, it's coming. I, I hate to sound like, I mean, next thing you know, you, you know, your pastor is like, oh, he's always gloom and doom. No, I don't want to look at it as gloom and doom. I want you to look at it as you're just one step closer to being home with the Lord. Well, I noticed all the older women said amen, and the younger women, you didn't say anything. <laughs> but that's the, way, that's the way it is. Ladies, live your lives as Christ is coming back today. Plan that he's coming back in 100 years. Live your life as he's coming back today. Would you be satisfied? I said that at the Amber's funeral last week. It's been two weeks today, the night that she'll pass, and... Um, I said that at, at, at the funeral, God never promises you tomorrow. He only gives you this day. And I remember coming here on Sunday morning. I'm sure that Amber and Eric expected their Sunday to be a whole lot different than it was. And how many of us live our lives like you've got a thousand years ahead of you. And in all reality, none of us will be here in a hundred years. So exercise this gift of love every opportunity 
that you have. Now we know that the truth about God's, about Christ's union with His church, uh, you know, when we talk about love, is illustrated by a Christian marriage. And we know that from the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. Ephesians 5, 22, 23. Old Testament saints were saved by faith, and they worshiped God, but they did not think of themselves as one with God through Jesus Christ. Do you understand this great mystery that you have been given? And I'm going to emphasize that tomorrow in tomorrow's sermon. Uh, uh, you, you need to understand that as great as the Old Testament saints, Abraham and Sarah, Ruth, when you think of women of faith in the Old Testament, they could not even comprehend being one with God. Couldn't even comprehend it. And yet you ladies, this morning, as believers in Christ, the Holy Spirit that indwells in you allows you to say Jesus is Lord because you are one with him. We don't grasp that concept well enough as Christians. Because if we do, we would never be sitting on the sidelines. The one who left the throne of glory, humbled himself and became a man, walked this earth after creating it, was abused, was beaten, was smitten for your sake and afflicted and suffered for your sake. The very ones that he created the very ones that he would die for, the ones who mocked him. Think about your own lives. Before Some of you grew up in the church. You don't remember a time when you didn't know the Lord. But others in here, you came to saving faith later in life. And you remember what a blasphemer you were. You remember what a, who you were before you came to Christ and, and God died for you. And, then, and not only that, now he says you're his child. And, and ladies, you're a co-heir. I said this at the men's group, and it, it's worth repeating because... To you ladies, because I want you to hear it too, so you don't ever make this dumb boneheaded mistake. Don't ever let me hear you say, and don't ever post on Facebook that somebody died and got their wings and God's got another angel in heaven. <laughs> and the reason I say that is you have just belittled that person's standing with God. You have just made them a watchdog. That's what you've done. Do you realize that the angels cannot even begin to grasp what you understand? You are one with Christ. He has saved you and made it. You are co-heirs with Christ. You're not an angel. You're co-heirs. You will rule with Him. The angels don't rule anything. They're His servants. They were created to serve and worship the holy God. And you were created to worship Him for so much more. And so when you say those things and you say things like he's looking down upon you, he's not, nobody's looking down on you. Oh my goodness. I would not want to look at my knucklehead kids doing stupid things if I was in heaven. <laughs> I mean, think about that just for a microsecond. If you, if, if you were watching them, you'd be going, oh my gosh, what are they doing? Oh my God. Oh my, oh my gosh. Yes. You're not looking down at them. When you get to heaven, your focus is on Christ. And that's the problem with too many of us today. We think that it's all about us and it's all about him. It's all about him. All right, ladies. Um, when we meet, we meet back together in two weeks, we'll continue in our study here. Uh, I, I just really appreciate uh, your diligence in this study. I know some of, some of it can be uh, redundant, but I think redundancy is important, uh, especially when a subject is so important in our lives as Christian love so i can't wait to get a report about last night i'm kind of jealous uh, that i you know I, I wasn't gonna bring kathy last night i said kathy you got a ride and she goes no i said okay i'll take you and i was thinking to myself well i'll just i'll listen <laughs> uh, no i won't do that i'll leave them alone and, and so kathy why don't you see if somebody's coming your way and kathy was able to get a ride michelle thank you again so much for that Picking her up and taking her home. And I know any of you would do it. I know. I trust, we try not to inconvenience people. And, and I think Michelle only had to go a mile out of her way. So that was, that was, a, that was a blessing. Um, Pastor Cal and I are going to talk right after this. But I'm inclined because of the weather that's coming in. We'll probably do the same thing we did last week. Have one service. Um, 
We will still have tomorrow night's meeting, Pastor Cal. I think we should still go ahead and do that because uh, the snow is supposed to end by 10. The other last week, the last week it was uh, the, the advisory went all the way to seven. Uh, tomorrow it's the advisories like from 10 o'clock at night till 10 in the morning, I think. Isn't that correct? Am I wrong? Yeah. So um, we'll, we'll talk, but, but uh, yes, questions? Somebody had a question? Will we still do communion? Yes, we are going to do communion tomorrow. And our church is open. You got a four-wheel drive, show up. Uh, if you want somebody to come pick you up, call, call a neighbor that's got one. And, uh, and you tell your friends and neighbors, you know, we were the only church. I, I, I got to be careful. We're the only church I know of that was open in Amelia this past Sunday. The big ones were closed. CFO was closed. Low Covenant was closed. Amelia Baptist was closed. I don't know about Jetersville and Sandy Creek, but uh, I know they were closed last week. Our church will be open. It'll, be, it'll always be open here. Pastor Kyle and I will be here. If Pastor Kyle got to come pick me up or I got to go pick him up, we'll, we'll be here. And then we'll get our associate pastor, Pastor Jamie, get up that hill of his and we'll get him here too. So. <laughs> and that means if pa Pastor Kyle comes, Gina will be here. <laughs> and if Pastor Mark comes, Kathy will be here. So please come. Any questions? Yes. Uh, go down to... Uh, Michelle, I didn't knock my coffee off this week. Uh, go down to verse 7. 1 through 7. Okay? <laughs> Amy, would you pray for us? Amen.